Elvery is the analyst, economist, extraordinaire from the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. I had the pleasure of hearing Joel present last fall to one of my professional organizations. He made it actually more clear in understanding than many would. Uh, he has three hours of PowerPoint slides, so just sit back, <laughs> get relaxed. No. What I've told him is that we have 30 minutes, and he's going to give it probably about 20 plus minute prepared remarks, give you a lot of data on the U.S. and Columbus. So that'll be the bracket, the country and, and the city. And I'll come up afterwards to ask for questions for, for our guest speaker. Without further ado, Joe Elvery, thank you so much for coming today, and we look forward to your talk. All right, so uh, Callaway made it clear that he was ready and willing to use his hook if I run over, so I will do my best to avoid the hook. Um, I just have to share first off that uh, what I'm going to say today are uh, my views, not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland or the Federal Reserve System. Um, let's see. Aha, excellent. Okay. Um, I would like to start off with telling people a little bit about what Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland is. We're one of 12, uh, the U.S. is divided into 12 Federal Reserve Bank districts. We are uh, the fourth district, and we cover western Pennsylvania, all of Ohio, eastern Kentucky, and West Virginia. Don't ask me who drew those lines, <laughs> but those are the lines we have. And day-to-day, uh, -day, a lot of our functions are about um, a combination of payments processing, so moving payments between banks, as well as bank regulation, uh, checking supervisions, making sure uh, balance sheets aren't that risky, that sort of thing. We also have roles in community development. Uh, we do research. And then the part of the Federal Reserve System that people are usually most familiar with is our role in monetary policy. So eight times a year, they meet to set the federal funds rate and other elements of the nation's monetary policy. So we're, uh, we're, we're the only decentralized central bank in the world. <laughs> um, so we have these 12 districts all over the country, as well as the Board of Governors in D.C. As Callaway mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, conditions, economic conditions nationally in Columbus area, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, current monetary policy. So um, you might have felt this last year, but 2018 was one of the uh, strongest years the economy's had since basically since 2014 was the last time we had a sort of equivalent uh, growth rate. So growth, growth rate was just under 3% overall for 2018. Um, the range that people think is now normal is somewhere between just in the 2, 2.1, 2.2%. So uh, being close to 3% is a very, very strong growth year. It is forecasted that growth is going to slow down, not just in the first quarter of uh, 2019, but we're going to see growth, growth slow down uh, in 2019. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the forecast. Um, one of the real areas of sunshine uh, and strong growth in 2018 was in manufacturing. Manufacturing growth was, uh, manufacturing output grew 3.6%, which is its strongest growth since 2020. Uh, we all, we almost always see very strong manufacturing growth right after a recession. When the recovery begins, it recovers very quickly. And so to be uh, comparable to what we were seeing back then is, is very good. So very strong growth in manufacturing production last year. Um, on the employment side, uh, February was the 101st month in a row that the nation added jobs. Um, the prior record before this expansion, the prior record was 68 months in a row. Um, so we've, that record's crushed. Before we get all excited and think that's wonderful, as, as research shows that that's typical when you have such a deep recession, you have a long uh, expansion afterwards. It's, it's the, what you would expect. Now that I've told you this good news, the bad news is that February's employment growth was, um, was weaker than it's been uh, since the hurricane in September of 2018, or I'm sorry, 2017. Um, so the nation added basically 20,000 jobs. However, if we look over like a three-month average or a six-month average, we're still seeing em employment growth 
employment growing faster than the labor force does. So we mean, that means that the labor market continues to tighten. And, and most analysts expect that this number, the low reading for February is going to get revised up. Um, one of the interesting, one of the most important things that's been happening uh, in terms of the macroeconomy re in, in recent months is that the nation's labor force participation rate has started to rise. So uh, for years now, um, the labor force participation rate has been falling. And then in the last two years, it's really flattened out. Um, but if you look at the nation's demographics, you would expect that we, are, we would still see our labor force participation rate falling. Uh, basically, as the baby boomers are hitting retirement ages, just uh, that kind of that's going to pull the nation's labor force participation rate down. So one of my colleagues who's done a lot of research on the subject likes to say flat is the new up. So if we're seeing flat labor force participation rate, that's actually very strong. It's showing the, the economy. Uh, labor force is one of the key constraints that sort of determines how much the economy can grow. And so now, in recent months, not only are we seeing flat, we're seeing rising labor force participation rate. Uh, and this seems to be coming from young men who had been not participating in the labor force starting to participate again. Um, that's the national picture. Ohio is still following the trend that, that you'd expect based on demographics. Um, in terms of unemployment rate, the nation's unemployment rate uh, for the last half of 2018, since, since the middle of 2018, it's been at what most economists would call full employment. So full employment is the point where uh, we expect that any more significant growth in uh, employment is going to uh, essentially push up wages and uh, push up inflation to some extent. So um, there's debate about where this is, but pretty much everyone would agree that uh, the unemployment, current unemployment rate is about that uh, full employment point. And uh, you look, I have a bunch of different measures here. The, really, the takeaway from that is regardless of how you want to measure unemployment, uh, we're seeing improvements. Uh, it's improved dramatically since the recession, and, it, and it's continued to fall in the last year or so. Um, but now it's essentially flattened out. Uh, one of the areas that this recovery has been very unusual is how slow uh, wage growth has been to come back. And um, 2018, we saw steady wage growth uh, throughout 2018. The most recent reading, which was for the fourth quarter of 2018, shows wages growing uh, about 3%. So 3% is in the neighborhood of what would be a typical level, what we sort of think historically is what's a normal level of wage growth. Uh, so we're, we're, we're finally seeing wage growth returning to what would be typically considered a normal level of wage growth. So that's one of those signs of uh, the labor market tightening is we're seeing the wage growth picking up. One of the key determinants of wage growth is inflation. We've also seen inflation essentially reach what uh, would be considered normal. So right now, the, uh, the inflation rate's in the neighborhood of 2%. And um, it's been pretty steady for the second half of, tw since really the second quarter of 2018, we've seen fairly steady inflation around 2%. Um, one of the areas where we've really seen some changes in the last couple months is in the interest rates. So long-term interest rates have fallen um, basically since the middle of December, and short-term interest rates have flattened out. We'll talk about monetary policy uh, and, and Federal Reserve policies a little bit later, but basically um, the, the Federal Reserve, uh, Federal Open Market Committee is signaling that they're expecting that inflation rate, or interest rates will remain fairly stable through 2019. And so these long-term interest rates have fallen in response to that, and the short-term interest rates have flattened out after this period of a couple of years of really where we're steadily increasing interest rates. Um, they're expected to be stable. Uh -huh. So, what do I want you to take away about the nation's economy? Output grew to almost 3% in 2018, which is the strongest year we've had since 2014. Manufacturing output grew more in 2018 than any other year since 2010. 
Employment continues to grow, though growth was weak in February. Wage growth has picked up speed, inflation is about 2% annually, and long-run interest rates have declined in recent months. Now I'm going to turn my attention to Columbus. So it's always fun to talk about Columbus economy because your economy is doing great. Um, and I want to take a minute and sort of say, what, what's, why is it doing great? What are the fundamentals that are sort of driving this? Part of it is the industry mix you have. So uh, you have uh, you know, pretty much everywhere in the, world, in the country, trade, transportation, and utilities is the single largest industry. There's just a lot of employment in retail trade, um, a lot of employment in transportation, so that's typical. Now your second largest sector is professional and business services. And you, that makes about 17% of Columbus's employment. Compare that to the nations where it's 14% or 13%, um, you have a strong specialization in professional business services. That's a good industry to be specialized in for a couple reasons. One, it's been growing, so that helps promote growth. The other is that it's a relatively high paying industry, and so it uh, creates strong incomes in the region. The other sector that you have very strong specialization in, or in another sector you have a very strong specialization in, is fin financial activities. This is similar to professional business services. It's been growing relatively rapidly, and uh, it's relatively high paying. So these are um, good specializations to have for your, for your region. Now, of course, one of the reasons that is is because Columbus sort of functions as a human capital magnet, right? So you have a lot of people coming to school to the Ohio State University, and that gives employers in the region a chance to sort of capture that, uh, that new, new skilled workforce. Um, I mentioned that your ink, uh, income and output is actually higher than nations um, per person. So it's a, a relatively productive and, and high income region. So that's good news. One of the things that allows Columbus to continue to grow rapidly is steady population growth. So um, population grew 1.6% 1, 1. in 2017. That's the most recent year we have data for. What does 1.6% mean? It means 2,600 new residents per month, net, right? So some people coming, some people leaving. Net, you gain 2,600 people per month in 2017. Um, 2017 was a especially strong year. It's typically in the 2,000 to 2,200 people per month, which is still very good. So that uh, stable, that steady population growth helps sustain your region's growth. Um, and one of the reasons that, you, that you're able to continue to have that population growth is your actual housing costs are relatively um, very reasonable, actually. So um, this is dollar per square foot rent. You'll see that it's going up in Columbus a little bit. This is for the metro area as a whole. So the metro area includes um, a very large set of counties, including some semi-rural areas. So I know if you look at some submarkets, your rents are growing up much faster than, than this graph would suggest. But uh, the fact that there are those uh, essentially semi-rural areas around the, the metro's core, that basically works as a release valve, like a pressure release valve. Um, so people always have the alternative to build out there and move out there, which then uh, keeps limits upward rent pressure in, in the core. And so as a result, you having the, you're in the situation of having relatively strong incomes while still having relatively reasonable co cost of living. Um, and so that's, um, that really helps promote your population growth because um, combination of strong income, reasonable cost of living makes it very attractive. That's, there's many other reasons to be attracted to Columbus, but that's sort of the, the economist you know, hat is. <laughs> Good pay, cheap rent, yes. <laughs> um, so I mentioned before that the nation's uh, unemployment rate has basically been at full employment since the middle of 2018. Well, Columbus's unemployment rate has been at full employment since basically the middle of 2015. So you've got about a three-year head start on the nation at what it's like to be in a, uh, a full employment market. Um, now the interesting thing is it's actually been very stable. So your unemployment rate reached 
4%, and it basically stayed there for three years now, um, four years now. And um, that's in part because you, have, you continue to have this strong population growth. So that's uh, what's keeping your unemployment rate stable. So now on the not so great news, but I'm going to try to convince you it's not as bad as it looks, your employment growth is slowing down a little bit. So uh, for years, your unemployment, your, so this purple line at the top is Columbus, dark blue line is the US, and green line is Ohio. For years now, Columbus's employment growth has st pretty consistently outpaced the nation as a whole. So you're seeing stronger employment growth than the nation as a whole. Now in 2018, um, you fallen just below and basically on par with the nation, but still stronger than Ohio. What's going on here is your labor market has gotten sufficiently tight that it's just hard to add employees. Um, and so that tightness in the labor market is slowing employment growth. That would be my read. I don't see this as a sign of weakness in, uh, in your regional economy. It's just a sign that you know, you've gotten to the point where uh, your, your labor market is tight enough that it is difficult to add employees. Um, in terms of where is this growth coming from, this should have, yes, excellent. So um, your growth in financial activities was almost double that of the nation's growth rate between June 2017 and June 2018. That's the most recent data that I trust. Um, and um, so this is good. It's one of your specialties, right? One of the industries we talked about is being Columbus having a specialization in, and you're still, your growth is outpacing the nation. Um, and then on the flip side, your professional business services growth is slow, slower than the nation as a whole. Um, I'm going to just say very quickly that your house price growth con uh, continues to be strong. And um, better than Ohio and better than, than, than the nation as a whole. So, there we go, excellent. Takeaways about Columbus, uh, your output per person continues to grow. You tend to continue to be a very productive region. Unemployment, great, un unemployment rate remains around 4%. Employment growth has slowed in the face of these tight labor markets. And house prices grew 6.5% in the last 12 months. We don't do projections at the metro level, but Moody's does. So I'll be glad to share, with, share you what Moody's expects for 2019. Uh, Moody's expects that Columbus is going to have output growth of 3.1% and employment will grow 1.2%. So it's often hard to translate percents into what's that going to feel like. Basically, it's going to feel like 2018. That's what this is saying, right? So your output growth and your employment growth will be on par with 2018. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about the uh, forecast and monetary policy. So uh, this, is, this is a measure that economists focus on, particularly macroeconomists focus on, called the output gap. Most people, has anyone here heard of output gap? Is this familiar to you? Raise your hands. Yeah, OK. <laughs> this is like a, a crucial input to almost all monetary policy models in the United States. And what this tells us is, how much is the nation producing today relative to what the Congressional Budget Office's Office expects us to be able to produce? And so when you're negative, that means you have a lot of under, un, underutilized capacity. You could be producing more than you are. When it's positive, you're actually producing more than you think than CBO thinks we can. So we've been in the positive territory since the second quarter of 2018. And the question is, what happens next? So this graph shows you going back to, I think, 68. Um, all these gray bars are recessions. And so the question is sort of what, hap what typically happens? Well, in the past, it used to be common that we'd run above potential output for a period, and then we would come back down. Then in the last sort of three cycles, what we've seen here, we never actually came out above potential output. 1996 to 2001, we had output growing faster than uh, potential output grew. 
What was going on in that period? Well, we were seeing rapid technological change, right? There was a ton of new technology getting adopted, so productivity growth was stronger in that late 90s period than it had been since the 60s. Um, so we're seeing strong productivity growth. We also had unexpectedly large labor force growth. So this pushed us to have, be able to sustain growth above potential output. 2006 uh, to, to uh, the end of 2007, basically we, we hit potential output and then st stopped growing. We grew at the same rate as potential output. We stopped seeing the output gap grow. Well, here we didn't have the kind of productivity growth. We didn't see the labor force uh, growth that we had seen. So that's why we sort of hit potential output and st stopped growing or growth slowed. So the question is, what's going to happen this time, right? So at right now, most of the smart money is on this 2006 pattern, where we're going to see growth slow down because we've reached potential. Productivity growth has been relatively slow. Uh, there has been a little bit of pickup in labor force growth in recent months, but overall, it's still fairly slow. So that's what you're going to see in this forecast is that we're now expecting growth to slow down. Potential output grows at about 2% per year at this point. So when we say slow down, we mean growth is going to be in the neighborhood of 2%. And that is exactly what the Federal Open Market Committee is projecting for 2019. So the uh, Federal Open Market Committee is the group that sets monetary policy for the US. And their uh, most recent predictions which were released last week, is that growth will, uh, output will grow 2.1% in 2019, and then sort of come down to 2% in the years after. Um, inflation is going to stay in roughly the same neighborhood it's been this year, so right around 2%, and stay there for the next couple of years. That's their forecast. And the unemployment rate is also essentially going to stay where it is right now and then start rising in a couple of years. Um, with that, the majority of federal open market committees members expect the federal funds rate to remain unchanged in 2019. So we're, uh, they expect that, that we're going to leave the, the federal funds rate where it is now. Essentially, interest rates are, will be stable. Um, the market, on the other hand, puts about a 60% chance. Uh, they're saying there's a. Uh, three and five chance that uh, the interest rate's going to come down in 2019 and a zero <laughs> chance that it's going to go up. Um, so that's, uh, I'm telling you what, the, what both says. You can decide what you think. Um, so just to wrap up, nation's economy had strong growth in 2018. Uh, we're seeing labor forces tight, uh, labor markets tight with wage growth. Columbus area continues to experience strong growth, even though your employment growth has slowed down a little bit. The nation's output is, expect, is expected to grow about 2% in 2019. This is what we would consider normal growth. Um, it's not bad. It's not good. It's normal. And a majority of FOMC members expect the federal funds rate will remain unchanged in 2019. So that's, um, and I just have one more bit of prepared remarks. One of, the, one of my functions within the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland is to stay in touch with business contacts throughout our district and so that we can know what's going on. Uh, we find that business people know what's going on before the data can tell us. <laughs> and so it's a tremendously valuable input for us as we're thinking about what happens with monetary policy. Um, we do a survey eight times a year. Um, it's a short online survey. It takes about five minutes. That um, helps us stay in touch with people, engage what's going on in the economy. If you'd like more information about that uh, and would be interested in participating, please either email me or come talk to me afterwards. I'll be glad to talk to you about it, and uh, then we can reach out later. And with that, I'm glad to take questions. Joel, we appreciate that presentation so much on the national economy in Columbus. And Joel drove down just for us today from Cleveland. He wasn't here for any other function, and we appreciate your special effort to travel down today. So questions for Joel Elvery, please. Millie? I'm wondering, 
wondering, does politics play any part in what the growth of the economy is doing? Um, so the question was, does politics play any part in the in growth and what the economy is doing? Um, so yes, I, I think one of one of the re reasons we believe that, or analysts believe that 2018 growth was so strong, is that we essentially had this very large what's called a fiscal stimulus. So the tax cuts passed in 2017, and the essentially were already affecting corporate balance sheets in 2018. Uh, was one piece of the puzzle of why growth was so strong last year. So that kind of fiscal stimulus can have an effect. However, most analysts now predict that that's essentially passed. That was like a short, think of it sort of like a sugar high. So we had that little sugar high, and now we're back. Um, so the answer is yes, although I think it's also safe to say less than politicians think. <laughs> um, so. Again, I'll remind you that's my opinion, not that of the Federal Reserve System. <laughs> you're, not, you're not talking about tweets, are you? No. Anybody else? Ken Ackerman? Could you explain the difference between unemployment rate and participation rate and why oh. the latter gets so little attention? Short version. Yeah, I will. Um, so the unemployment rate is the number of people who are without a job but actively looking for work. That's the definition of the sort of the, the top number in the unemployment rate. The bottom is the size of, is the number of people in the labor force, which is the people who are employed plus the people who are unemployed. Um, so that one is a nice, that measure tends to be focused on because it's a good sense of sort of where are we in the business cycle, right? Is the labor market tight? Is the labor market loose? The labor force participation rate um, is more about it's more of a long-term measure. How much capacity does the economy have? And so when that's shrinking, it's a, a headwind on, on the economy's capacity. When that labor force participation rate growing, it's a tailwind on, on the nation's capacity. So it's more of a long-run issue, whereas unemployment rate tends to be a short run. And people tend to be focused on the short run, right? That just uh, seems to be human nature. I saw a hand way in the back. Bill? Bill, did you have a question? You did a good job of explaining on all your graphs what was happening when the line was going up. How about explaining what happened when the line went down? Um, so I'm not sure which, are, is there a specific graph you're thinking of or? No. <laughs> all right. Um, I, you know what, I'll, I'll give you, Here's the, the quick answer. I focus on what I think is the most important for you to take away. And so, um, you know, there's been, uh, there's some measures that have like ticked down the last couple months. And really I think that, that what we have to think about is, um, you know, last year we had incredibly strong growth and we're slowing down to a normal growth. I, I always try to tell people, picture you're on a bus and you're blindfolded, right? You don't know until the driver gets off the brakes whether you're stopping or slowing down. And where we were uh, in this, the, the fourth quarter of 2018, first quarter of 2019, is we're in that part where the bus driver's putting on the brakes. And now I think we finally know that he's pulling the, putting, pulling the foot off. And so I think that's the core, core comment is we felt the economy slow down. Um, but now we've reached that new level of growth. Um, and so we're, we're stable at that growth again. So that's why I focus more on the ups than the downs. So I see a couple of hands, Dave Ospa, and then John Martin, and then David. So Dave Ospa? I've got two, two, first one is a, a quick one. As uh, Fred is put out by the St. Louis Fed, does the Cleveland Fed have anything similar? And then do you have any comment on the growth of uh, consumer, corporate, and federal debt? All right. So um, first question around Fred. Uh, we have in inflation, we have what's called Inflation Central, where we provide a, a variety of data on inflation statistics. One of the measures that our, that our bank produces that's used um, throughout the system is the median CPI, which is a, a measure of sort of underlying inflation rates. So that we don't have something like FRED, which is designed to be like an all-encompassing data tool. 
But we do have a few specialty areas where we produce data um, that are, you can access through our website. The second question was about debt. So the debt's complicated. Um, so household debt right now is historically low. So, um, on, so on the household side, while consumer debt's growing, it's still relative to income levels, uh, lower than we've seen since we started measuring the data in 1980. Um, so household debt right now looks great. Corporate debt, um, generally, I think the, the consensus is that corporate debt is also at a healthy level given corporate balance sheets. Um, national debt, as um, national debt has continued to grow, it's historically large. Um, but as long as people continue to be willing to lend to the United States at such incredibly reasonable rates, it's not obvious that that's, you know, illogical. <laughs> so then the question becomes, well, what happens when people decide they don't want to lend to us at those rates? That's a great question for someone else. <laughs> Last month I attended the Economic Summit of Ohio Bankers Week. And the economists there, because you're out with gap uh, charts, he strongly pretty much said a recession's coming in 2019, early 2019. Why, why is, uh, I know economists all differ, but why would you say that's not gonna be the case? Yeah, so I mean, First, the question was, uh, he was at an event where some, uh, another economist predicted that um, there will be a recession early in 2019, and I'm not suggesting that there's going to be a recession at all in 2019. Um, so the first off, uh, economists always differ. There's a joke that, you know, anytime you have two economists, you have three opinions. Um, <laughs> but there's also... Um, Well, economists are quite poor at predicting when recessions are going to occur. Um, and so why do, I'm just going to tell you why I think we're not looking at that situation. Um, we're continuing to see relatively strong consumer demand. Um, we're continuing to see, if you look at quarter four, which is the most recent uh, GDP data we have, there was strong business fixed investment growth. Business fixed investment tends to be a, a good leading indicator. When, when businesses think biz, that they're you know, gonna see a slowdown, they pull back on investments. We're not seeing any kind of pullback on investments. Um, we're still seeing very mild inflation with no, with if anything people are expecting inflation will be a little bit weaker this year than it was last year. So there's not that inflation pressure that's gonna sort of shut the economy down. Uh, and labor force, uh, is continuing to grow sort of beyond people's expectations. So there's, there's a whole lot of things that point to the idea that we're gonna see this sort of steady 2% growth in 2019. Now, there are these clouds that could rain on that parade, right? So uh, there's a variety of uncertainty about, we, we look at our international trading partners and they're seeing their economy slow down, that's gonna be a headwind. Uh, we, no one really knows what's going to happen with all the trade agreements and how that's going to impact trade. Um, there's, so these, there are these factors out there, but overall, it looks like we're at sort of a, stab, a stable, steady place. Um, so that's, that's why, where I come down. Good summary. So the last hand that was up because of time is from an engineer to an economist. So David Pritchard, your question. Well, one question you may not want to try to answer is, uh, how can we get more people to move here seeing as available labor is a limit on our growth? And if you don't want to answer that one, then uh, <laughs> what, would, what would be the effect of a drastic increase in minimum wage since we're discussing this? Okay. Um, Which one do you want to take? I'm going to take the first question. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and um, I think. I mentioned before that uh, low rents is, is one of the reasons that um, you've been able to sustain population growth for so long. I think that uh, you have to stay on top of that. And so you have to think about how do you grow um, the, the supply of housing that's going to be accessible to where jobs are and affordable to people who are sort of entry level um, 
on and, you know modest to low income. So that is the like when you look at the piece of the Columbus puzzle of what's a ch potentially a challenge, that's what's potentially a challenge is seeing uh, typically the housing market's adding housing at higher income levels, uh, and you're not adding housing at a at a rate to keep up with the population growth you have. So that would be my short answer on on that one. Joel said he's able to take a few minutes afterwards up here at front table for those who you who would like to follow up with your additional questions, who we weren't able to get to today. Um, Joel, thank you so much for being so much on point nationally in Columbus. Good perspective. Last week I shared with everyone that we were having Federal Reserve from Cleveland's economists come to speak, and then with the FOMC meeting last week, I got lots of phone calls, emails, and texts. I can't wait for next Monday because last week I told them not to ask you when you were going to raise rates the next time and you couldn't answer that. And then after last week, the question would have been, when are you going to lower them? Um, so thank you all for, for your participation. And Joel, thank you for driving down today. When, we went, when I reached out to the Federal Reserve, there were several who'd come out to speak and said, that's, with all due respect, we want Joel Elvery. So thank you so much for coming today. Good sense of balance and, and levity with a lot of data. Thank you. That is inspirational suite. Meetings adjourned.